Now that the electronics are in, let's start wiring. If you haven't already seen it, check out this electrical wiring page on the Voron website. If needed, get familiar with this basic information because my video assumes we already have that knowledge. This is the most dangerous part of the build with the potential to cause fires and injuries. I bought cable raceways for wire management and the challenge is mounting them. You may or may not be familiar with the letters LSE or low surface energy. This refers to surfaces that are hard to bond, such as the polypropylene deck panel. Thurium VHB tape is preferred, but isn't available locally. So I tested leftover RTV and Loctite plastic glue. After 24 hours, you can see the RTV is completely useless while the Loctite will destroy the board before crapping out. However, I could not find the temperature rating of this glue, so use at your own risk. I just made a simple H pattern. The Voron kits mount the DIN rails in a perpendicular direction, which gives you more space to do this. I opted not to change my layout. Just make sure you have enough clearance and trim the raceways as required. If you are not confident in your wiring abilities, I would even suggest skipping all this until later, when you are certain everything works correctly. After all, it's mostly cosmetics. I noticed my Z motors are crooked, and this isn't just cosmetic. Fix this now or you'll probably forget later. Continue to check all your previous work as we continue. In the last video, I mounted the bed according to the manual. After filming, I gave it some thought and it really should have a quick disconnect for easy maintenance. For example, if the heater or fuse underneath goes bad. That way you don't have to flip the entire printer over to disconnect panels and wires. I began looking up the legality of using spade crimps for these wires when I found this and remember buying it from the sourcing guide. The Molex connector pins are spec'd for 14 to 20 gauge wire, and the sourcing guide does not list a larger crimping tool for these. Many people can't justify a tool for only six crimps, so a workaround is using needle nose pliers to fold the sleeves and secure the wire. I'll link a video below. The heater wires have a protective covering that needs to be pulled back so you can crimp the wire insulation underneath. These wires must be secured since they carry AC voltage. If you are not comfortable with any of this, leave it alone for now and save it for a future mod. I forgot to grab a shot until after the fact, but use a multimeter to test continuity on all these pins before inserting them into the connectors. Removal is a lot harder. For the bed thermistor wires, I will use a microfit connector. Some consider these optional since popular control boards use cheaper JST style connectors. However, the microfits have a better build quality and a higher 5 amp rating. They are also used for inline connections as there is no JST equivalent in the kit, unless you solder. If you don't know which connector to use, the female plug provides power to the male plug, like the one attached to the heater. Still confused? Just compare with a wall outlet. The female receptacle provides power to male plugs. I consider the smaller crimpers a requirement and there are two popular choices. The PA09 crimper works on 20 to 32 gauge wire. It's made in Japan and built well. It requires two crimps per pin, which takes more time and adds up since there are many wires in the build. The IWIS does both crimps at the same time and utilizes a ratcheting mechanism. However, the double layer jaw size may not fit every style of pin out there and may mangle it if the profile is off. Both crimpers do a cleaner job compared to needle nose pliers. The crimpers create an arch that secures both the wire conductor and insulation. The pliers just mash the sleeves down since they are tiny and hard to move in place. Inserting male pins into female microfit connectors suck due to a center tab up top that needs to be perfectly aligned. It's hard to capture on camera, but both the connector tab and pin should face up. Use a small screwdriver to nudge it in if necessary, but don't nick the wire. Inserting female pins into male connectors are much easier. Following the same orientation, they simply slide and click in. If you forgot to test continuity before inserting the pin, fingers crossed that you crimped it right. Otherwise, might as well cut it off and chuck it, because trying to de-pin it without a tool sucks. Make sure to leave extra slack in all these wires. You'll see why later. AC wiring. I start with the bed ground since I need the excess wire for other connections. After measuring and stripping, make sure you insert the wire all the way in. The insulation should slide past the entrance hole. 
I am using these common wire strippers with a built-in crimper, but there are dedicated crimpers with a ratcheting feature. The thickest wire for red connectors is 18 gauge, contrary to what you may have seen and read out there. Recap, the bomb specs 18 gauge minimum for AC wiring, so these connectors were sized accordingly. I went with 16 gauge, which requires larger blue connectors that are insulated manually using heat shrink. I am following the WAGO wiring diagram from the manual, which is straightforward. This is how the power inlet and switch look when done. Be careful not to reverse the line and neutral wire connections. I am using red for line, black for neutral, and green for ground. For grounding the frame, I used the short M3 by six screw so it fits the extrusion without bottoming out. Removing the anodizing is quite hard. I used both low grit sandpaper and a chisel, literally gouging the aluminum. Also, good luck stuffing in the T-nuts and wire with the raceway install. Check continuity between all the connections we made. Note that grounding the SSR also grounds both DIN rails. Next, power just the 24 volt PSU. That way, if anything is severely jacked up, you don't fry everything downstream. If you see this green light, it's a good sign. If you want to make sure, set the multimeter to DC mode and test the output voltage. Minus 25, which I believe is deliberately set slightly higher to allow for a slight voltage drop once everything is connected. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Regardless, it can be adjusted via this knob. If you want to test the input voltage, remember to switch the multimeter back to AC mode and be mindful of the probes while gathering readings. The housing of the PSU is an exposed metal ground that will spark if accidentally contacted. If you have clumsy, shaky hands, I use this method of screwing down the probe. A cool thing if you didn't know, after you power off, the screen light slowly dims as the voltage drops to a safe level. I'm guessing this represents the capacitor discharging. Once completely off, you can work safely. Repeat for the 5 volt PSU if you have one. Unfortunately, my blue connectors don't fit in these narrow terminals, so I have to use red connectors that max out at 18 gauge. Of course, I don't have any green 18 gauge wire, so I just used heat shrink to mark the ground. You need to buy more wiring than you think. Unless you want a mixed rainbow, for AC wiring, I recommend five feet minimum for each color. Since we already ground it, let's finish the bed wiring. I also mark these heater wires with heat shrink since one side comes out of the SSR and directly to the thermal fuse of the bed heater. I left plenty of slack since there's nothing in this bottom left raceway except motor wires. The two thermistor wires are crimped with a JST connector since it connects to the octopus board. Let's go over this one more time because it just keeps repeating. Make sure you strip the right amount of wire, the inner sleeve should only touch the exposed conductor. Using the PA09, Rest the locking tab of the pin against the crimper. Insert the wire until it stops and crimp away. Same with the remaining larger sleeve. You couldn't see this earlier, but choose the crimper hole that makes the sleeve square or slightly wider while lining it up. Press down again and voila. After doing a few, you get the hang of it. Insert the pin into the connector until the tab clicks in place. Once again, a tiny screwdriver can really help if the wire is too thin to go in without bending. If you are going CAN bus, you can leave the wires disconnected from the controller until we flash the firmware later. Now that we know how to crimp, let's clean up the motor wires. They come with DuPont connectors which can attach in two directions. Based on this reference, the motor wires should be facing this direction if using the stepper online motors. Honestly, this can be inverted in software, so just make sure pins 1 and 2 are paired, and the same with 3 and 4. They each control one winding. Test for continuity if unsure. I printed out some more parts to support the CAN bus setup. First change is this alternate Y end stop which sits on top of the motor housing. Both will relocate the end stop, but this one eliminates the dead space at Y max. If you remember, this made me shift my bed forward to line up with the Z end stop below. If you printed the original piece like I did, don't change it out until you finish watching this video. I'm going to replace the solder JST connector with a crimped microfit. Since this part is subject to movement, solder can weaken over time. So instead of four solder joints, I reduce it to two. This piece is even thicker than the one I used before, so I used two spare M3 by 50 screws, the same ones used to attach the self burner cover. 
This Y cable chain mount will now be removed and replaced with a bumper that sits higher and will trigger the switch. Hold off on readjusting the Z end stop and bed until later. For a CAN bus, you still need a Z cable chain for the AB motor and Y end stop wires. Let's get that installed. The cable chain has two ends that need to be snapped on like Legos. There is a proper orientation of both the chain and ends. I opted to flush cut the tabs off both ends, but I suppose you could leave it on to cable tie the wires. For the bottom mount, push it hard against the bed extrusion to hold the yellow piece in place. Then you can screw it down from the other side. Good luck with the top side. You're going to have to get creative to keep the yellow piece from falling out while securing it. These chains have covers that pop open, which make wiring a lot easier instead of fishing it through the ends. However, the covers are stupidly hard to pop open. I had luck using a 2mm allen key and brute force. Unfortunately, the long PVC wire of these motors will not last inside cable chains. Before entering the chain, they must be terminated and switched to silicone or PTFE wiring. I have a single 16 foot roll of PTFE wire from AliExpress because I failed to read the quantity listed in the sourcing guide. It will be enough for the end stop wiring. While I like the PA09 crimpers for the JST connectors, the iWIS makes working with this tiny PTFE wire much easier. Instead of fiddling around with it, one crimp and it takes care of both sleeves. I have to be honest, working with PTFE wire sucks. The low friction properties that make it awesome inside cable chains also make it slippery and hard to grab due to the natural oil of your fingers. Even though it is stronger, it feels flimsy and easy to kink. The end stops are pinned in a certain direction, and remember, it's easier to cut off this connector than it is to de-pin it, so check your work. Speaking of which, don't forget the Z end stop. It's wired in the same way. For the AB motor wires, I will use microfit connectors for the inline connection. I am using the same colored silicone wires to go through the chain and to the electronics bay. When you are done, snap the covers back on and zip tie the wires at the beginning and end of the chain so it doesn't move around. You will need to find a way to hide or tuck the B drive motor wires along the extrusion. I use zip ties and squeeze it in place. For the stealth burner, we need to attach this piece to support the EBB36 cam board. The bridge needs to go since we aren't using the X cable chain. Surprisingly, this bag that came with the board includes all the necessary hardware, including these standoffs. They attach to the screws that mount the NEMA 14 motor, which are a bit short. On the left side, I am replacing the M3x30 with a 40mm length screw. Honestly, a 35 fits better, and once again, I don't have that. If you haven't already, buy a few of those. Work one side at a time so we don't mess up the gear slot we set previously. The smaller M3x8 screw on the right can actually be left alone, since there's enough threads to catch the standoff. However, I decide to play it safe, and I have these choices which are all from the bomb. I went with the 12mm long screw since I have a lot of those left. The mount also uses M3x8 screws. This is just a mock setup so I could trim the wiring for later. Speaking of which, you see these connectors? Time for more crimping. The last tool is for these screw terminals. If you just insert bare wires, frayed out strands may short out against the neighboring terminal. This is a feral crimper. I bought the blue version because it costs $1 more than orange but supports a wider range of wire sizes. These connections are known to be very strong. Just one problem. These terminals are so tiny, even my smallest 22 gauge barrel won't fit, so I will have to save this for later on the controller board. I don't know why, but these crimp pins that came with the EBB36 absolutely suck. I could not get clean crimps with either of my crimpers until I used these pins from the JST Amazon kit I've been using all along. Another thing that apparently sucks is this 5015 fan, which is wired backwards, is noisy, and has a short life. This brand is the AI Trip from Amazon. I would search for a more reputable brand. Also, this information wasn't easily available, but hot end fans should be ball bearing and not sleeved due to all the movement and vibration. The yellow X end stop wires should be connected to the second ground pin and one of the PB data pins to the right of it. The first pin is 5 volts, which you do not want to use since we are using micro switches and not Hall Effect. The Ohm Run probe is one of the worst to wire since the EBB36 only provides 5 volts of power, and the probe needs 24 volts. 
Therefore, we can't use this 5 volt pin and must tap a 24 volt source elsewhere. This board doesn't come with a BAT85 diode, so I will need to add that to the black signal wire. This wire insulation is really thick and hard to strip, so I used a pair of pliers to twist itself apart. I'm going to leave the brown wire long since I need to tap into that 24 volt source. For the diode, the black ring must face toward the probe. Solder it on. These header pins are not JST, they decided to use a DuPont or something else, which is really stupid. I don't have a DuPont connector kit, so even if I remove the wires from a motor connector, I don't have spare crimp pins. So I just use a two hole JST connector and flush cut the top locking tab for better clearance. Leaving slack is usually a good thing, but works against you when wiring behind the EBB36. This is due to clearance and rubbing against the Z chain. On the stock setup, the X chain contains all these wires. If you were wondering why both Y and stop relocates had adjustment holes, now you know why. You will have to readjust the bed and Z end stop again. That's why you need to leave slack in those wires. You can loop these cables to shorten them, but it's easier to wire them tight to begin with. The obvious trade-off is you have no margin for error when crimping these wires. Unless you are good at crimping, quite a few of them fail, snap, or simply go awry. For those going with the stock X and Y cable chain routing, your biggest challenge is running these 20 wires cleanly all the way to the electronics bay. At the very least, use a breakout PCB, which looks like this board to simplify future maintenance. You can then finish up any remaining wiring and set up clipper. I have a few more steps for CAN bus and that's why I opted not to finish all the wiring yet. This is so I can flash the CAN bus firmware on both this board and the octopus. I believe there is a reset button that requires dismounting this board anyways. Also, there has been some reports of these boards turning on the heaters during first startup. If you don't have it connected, it's not a problem. And that's it for this video. I went through the somewhat high level of wiring and there are videos out there that explain basic electrical in better detail. I highly suggest taking some time to watch those if this all seems over your head. A multimeter really is your best friend and I tested continuity on everything. Be safe and good luck. We have reached 10 videos and the build is pretty much done in terms of assembly. In the next video I will flash the CAN firmware to both boards and tidy up loose ends before the first startup.